So, uh, well, thank you uh, uh, very much for attending again to the, uh, the Mark Turner-Mark Centre for Fibrosing Lung Disease Monthly Seminars. It's uh, my great pleasure to, to invite Dr. Alexander Eckersley from the University of Manchester, who originally did his BSc in New York before coming to Imperial, I gather, to mm -hmm. do a, yeah. a Master of Research here 20 odd years ago. Um, this is the first time back. Yes, then. So, yeah, uh, welcome. And uh, thank uh, you. Probably hasn't changed at all. <laughs> uh, uh, and then, after a brief sojourn working in the North Sea drilling for oil, uh, went and did a PhD uh, at the University of Manchester, where he uh, started to look at extracellular matrix and in particular fibrin, and has uh, progressed up the career ladder now as a lecturer in aging. And so it's uh, very exciting to hear his thoughts on how the extracellular matrix uh, in, in aging and uh, changes in aging and, and the skin and how that may relate to fibrotic diseases more generally. So uh, without any further ado, uh, I'll invite you to give your uh, seminar entitled Novel Progenic Approaches for Exploring Pan Organ Extracellular Matrix Damage in Aging and Disease. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, and it's been good catching up with a few of you um, earlier today. It's a lot of really great work. Um, so yeah, I'm a Alex lecturer from Manchester. And over the last sort of 10 years, I've been looking, the, my main focus and now my lab's focus is looking at axillary matrix damage in the context of aging. So the accumulation of damage over time um, and it turns out that there weren't many tools or ways of doing this um, very easily. And so we've had to come up with our own sort of ways and approaches to, 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 to do it. And so I'll be talking a bit about that today. And hopefully some of the approaches that I show you might be um, interesting uh, for you guys in the context of fibrosis, which I know which we all know is an age-related dis disorder as well. So there's a lot of connection. Um, I work mostly in skin, uh, as Gisley said, um, and skin's a great organ because it's, you know, it's accessible. Quite a lot of people are very happy to give skin biopsies, um, not so much, I guess, lung biopsies from healthy patients. Um, uh, it's also got an exposome, a bit like the lung, things like pollution, smoking. Unlike the lung, you also have the influence of the sun when it comes to skin. So UV actually accounts for about 80% of, of aging signs that you see on skin, like wrinkles, silver linkages. So, you know, when we look at the exolar matrix um, architecture, uh, the elastic fiber is one of the first things to go. So in, in intrinsically aged skin, that's photoprotective skin, like, like in your, your um, back or your buttock, for example. Um, what you'll see is these lovely candle arbor structures sort of disappear um, over time. And then collagen also, you, you get less collagen as you age. But then in UV exposed areas, and in, in, in some exposed areas of skin, like your forearm or your face, you get the complete degeneration of this architecture. So elastic fibers become completely um, sort of amorphous and um, collagen one also, uh, you know, mostly disappears over time. So why is this? Um, well, the main prerequisite for a lot of these mechanisms um, comes from the longevity of the extracellular matrix. So, whereas in um, intracellular proteins, which turn over millions, if not thousands of times in your life, um, collagen, for example, dermal collagen in your skin only turns over five times. So every 20 years, you might get some, some new skin, 15, 20 years, um, some, some new collagen. In places like cartilage um, and in the intervial disc and in tendons, actually collagen one has a, has a half-life, something ridiculous, like 170 to 200 years or something. So it really doesn't turn over, it's, it's, it just stays there. Um, collagen two in cartilage, 80% of it is turned over by the time you are um, 80 years old. So 20% of it will have been there since birth. And as far as we can tell, lung elastic fiber um, components don't turn over. The ones that you're born with remain. Of course, as you grow, you get more laid down, um, but you know they, they, once they're there, they're there. And so what that means is that they can accumulate damage over time with aging mechanisms like you know oxidation from reactive oxygen species, UV in the context of skin, which can denature and and, and disassociate 
um, ECM proteins, uh, glycation, which can lead to advanced glycation end products, so you get higher cro you know, cross-linking and stiffness. And that sort of changes over time. And the way people have characterized changes mostly is by looking at abundance changes, which has nothing to do with the accumulation of, of modifications, or looking at changes in, in, in the architecture um, histologically, which you know, really by that time it's, it's too late. And so we thought a good way, well, I thought early on, a good way of doing this might be through uh, mass spec. Now, I'm not gonna go into too much technical detail because that's not really what this talk is about. Um, but just to put it simply, to do protein at mass spec, you have your tissue, you extract your proteins, in tradi you know, traditional bottom-up, um, you, 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 they're too big to fly down mass spec, so you add a very um, specific enzyme, uh, like trypsin, for example, that cleaves it into peptides, um, and then you, you do some liquid chromatography, um, separate your, your peptides by size and charge, um, and by doing two forms of MS, one where you detect the intensity and the precursor ion, and then, and then you fragment it, and that lets you detect the sequence of the, of the peptide. Essentially, you can find out two things. One, what proteins are in your sample, and two, the abundance, relative abundance of protein in your sample, which correlates with how much peptide you detect, which is in the intensity of your, of your spectra. Now, the main challenge when it comes to EC, when it comes to mass spec of ECM, and you guys might know this in the context of fibrosis, is extracting ECM proteins are very difficult, right? Because they're so big, they're so cross-linked, they're multimeric, um, you know, trying to get them in a state where they're just floating around so trypsin can come and clean them is extremely hard. And so actually trying to, to quantify ECM proteins by proteome mass spec has always been a huge challenge. But in that challenge actually lies a opportunity. Because if you think about how um, trypsin, which is the, the enzyme we add to create peptides, how that cleaves across a protein structure, it really depends on um, the solubility, the three-dimensional structure, how it fits into it and the multimeric component and, and within the network itself. So if you were to add trypsin to this theoretical protein, for example, you get a, a certain pattern of peptides being yielded across the structure, right? If you imagine that protein goes through processes of aging, like glycation, like UV and ROS denaturation, um, that pattern might change. So in glycation, for example, you get advanced glycation end products that make that part of the protein stiffer. Trypsin won't be able to come in and cleave, and so you get less peptides being liberated from that region. UV, for example, in the context of skin or, or ROS in all tissues, that mostly denatures protein. And so you get, um, you know, you, 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 you get trypsin able to come in and, and cleave um, cryptic epitopes that it couldn't do before that liberates more peptides, so you get an increase in peptide signal from that part of the protein. Similarly with MMPs, so um, proteases that are, are being what you're being chronically exposed to. Um, if you're a long-lived protein, you get fragmentation, and those fragments are more soluble, easily cleaved by trypsin, you get more peptides. And so what that means is that the, that, that pattern of peptides across the region of a protein, across the whole structure, changes in, in one context versus another context, whether that's younger age or fibrotic, non-fibrotic, or, or any kind of sort of comparison that you're doing. And that's the whole the concept of peptide location fingerprinting, which is what we've been developing. And so we, we, the first thing we did was to ask whether we could do this in vitro. And so what's nice about skin is that, is that the main um, component that, that, that degenerates first the elastic fiber is actually the fibrillin microfibril component of the elastic fiber. And you can purify that by size exclusion chromatography and you get this beautiful bees on a string structure. When you look at it um, with AFM, with atomic force microscopy. Um, and what's interesting is you can irradiate these with, with a physiological dose of UV, similar to, to, to that of the sun, same wave band composition. Um, and you can look at whether the, the structure of, of these beads change. And actually, when you radiate them, the beads swell. So, so, that, so you can imagine a, a ball of string unraveling. It gets bigger. 
And so you see that that bead swelling and the, the distance between the beads also increases. So you know that you're inducing some kind of structural change and you can validate that. So if you take irradiated microfibrils and non-irradiated and you fly them down a mass spec, the main protein fibrillin one, um, you can map the peptides that you detect back to the structure. So this is fibrillin one going from the N terminus all the way to the C terminus here. What we've done is we, it is the darker the, the domains are, the more peptides we detect. And so what we found is um, if you look at irradiated fib, um, fibrillin, so solar simulated radi radiation versus control, you see that there are these changes in peptides being yielded across the structure. If you irradiate with a different wave band of UV, so UVB, which is the main wave band that causes sunburn, you can see that a lot of the same patterns recur. So you get, you get a conserved change, for example, within the EGF domain one here, both regardless of the UV source that you use. Um, and so, and similarly with this EGF domain over here, and then you get this, this characteristic dip in these two domains over here. And so that told us that, yeah, at least in vitro, you could use this kind of technique to probe for ECM damage, so a fingerprint of damage, at least in vitro. So the question was, could we do this in vivo? Now, Back then, I'd written a really simple Python script to, to map peptides and quantify them and statistically test them across a couple of proteins, but I needed to do this on a proteomic level, so every single protein in my whole sample. Um, and I couldn't really do that. I didn't have the technical know-how or, the, or, or, or the, the software engineering skills to do this. So my, I got in contact with my good friend, Matisse, who now works at Sanger. And I think um, a couple of you, one of you has worked with him before. Um, so he essentially turned this concept into a web tool that's free to use. Um, what it does, it takes all the peptides that you detect via just normal LCMS SMS. It could be any LCMS MS data set. It um, maps it back to your protein. So you segment your protein in, into 50 amino acid size bins or segments, map your peptides. You can compare it between two groups. So fibrotic, non-fibrotic, aged, young, um, in this case, it's looking at photo age versus photo protected. And then you quantify your peptides across the protein structure and look for changes. And so the first um, thing we did was we used it, this, this kind of um, peptide mapping approach um, on um, a data set that we, that we generated from photo age forearm versus photo protected buttock, just to look at the influence of UV within the same people uh, matched. And you can see that when you look at the, the, the histological structure of, of elastic fibers, for example, there's a huge difference between photoprotected buttock and photoage forearm. So you get, you get a lot of um, amorphous elastin deposited, for example, um, the complete loss of architecture. And so what we wanted to do is, is, is probe um, structure-associated differences within proteins in this context. And what we found was that actually, you can do standard proteomic analysis, looking at differences in protein abundance at the same time as doing peptide location fingerprinting, and you find very different biomarkers. So for example, we found increases in the, in, in the abundance of um, base membrane proteins. Uh, and at the same time, we found um, in similar base membrane, in different base membrane proteins, we were getting structure associated changes. And just to highlight a few um, proteins of interest, um, fibulin-1, which is an important glycoprotein, so elastic fiber-associated protein. Um, this N-terminal end over here, we see a significant um, increase, or a higher number of peptides being liberated from that region in photoprotected buttock versus photoexposed forearm. Similarly, in collagen-6, alpha-3, there's certain areas of the regions of the protein that are, are, are you're getting a different, significantly different peptide yield Again, by glycan, an important proteoglycan for um, TGFB regulation changes. Galactin 7, which is a wound healing protein, same thing. So, what does this mean? Well, it means that we can identify structure associated changes within proteins on a proteomic scale, but we don't really know what that means. What is the nature of the change that we're seeing? You know, what are the downstream consequences? What's the impact of this? That's what we don't yet know. That kind of insight came down the line. So this was during COVID times where it was very difficult to generate your own data set. 
And, you know, so, so sitting there twiddling our thumbs, what we decided to do was to contact our collaborators from across um, the globe. So Herbert, I think you guys might know Herbert Schiller. Um, he looks at fibrosis, but also aging lung. And he had a fantastic data set looking at, at young and aged mouse lung. Um, and then Danny Chan, who's, who's, who looks at intervertebral disc aging over at Hong Kong University. Uh, Xi Ming, um, he looks at um, age-related um, atherosclerosis. And so, you know, they all had these really nice proteomic data sets that we could probe using this screening tool in order to try and find um, structure associated changes in proteins that were age-related and maybe even um, associated or correlate, correlative between these different tissues. And so I want to start with the IVD part. So intervertebral disc, again, it ages very similar to a lot of other organs, whereby as time goes on, it completely, it, it, it can degenerate quite badly, right? So you have the nucleus pulposus in the middle, and you've got these collagen, um, fibular collagen rich annulus fibrosis, which have this, have this anti parallel um, lamellae structure that wrap around the MP. And you can see that, that structure almost completely disappears in quite a few um, aged um, cases. Sometimes you get de de degeneration where you get herniation of the disc through the posterior region. And so that's what we call a slip disc, right? So some profound changes happening. Um, in aging. And so what Danny's lab had was they had a really, really rich proteomic data set where they had taken little um, spatially resolved parts of the disc. So left lateral, posterior, anterior, and they were all analyzed separately. They were fractionated to help. So you had 10 different fractions of, of, um, of different protein components all analyzed separately. It must have cost them a fortune, but they had it. And so we did some PLF and this is just a few um, markers that we found that we thought we think is interesting. So this is collagen one alpha two. Um, and the first thing um, I want to show you is up here we have age, and this is the number of peptides um, quantified um, in age along the protein versus young. And then the, then the line in the middle is just the, the, the average normalized peptides in age minus young, so you can see increases or decreases in, in, in age, in, in aging. So the first thing to note that you'll notice is that regardless of where we sampled it from, we get the exact same pattern, right? So it doesn't matter where, whether it's posterior, left lateral, anterior, we see the same changes in, in aging. Um, the next thing that I'll point your attention to is the C-terminal propeptide region over here, where we see a significant significantly lower peptides being yielded in age versus young. Now, this propeptide region is only found in, um, in pro-collagen. It's then cleaved off before it being incorporated into the, into the fibril. And so if you're seeing peptides from that region, it means that really you're seeing active collagen synthesis. And so what we found by looking at this historical data set was that you're getting a lot more active collagen synthesis in young than in age. Another thing that was interesting was just downstream of this prominent cleavage site, we see a spike of peptides um, in all three cases um, in, in age versus young. And we, it is actually quite a well-known degradation product where you have a, a, a prominent cleavage site and it releases this quarter fragment of, uh, of collagen. So that's what we think is, is happening here, where we're seeing a lot more of that fragment in the age samples versus the young. So two different mechanisms slash consequences um, of, of aging um, that are occurring along the same protein using this approach that we've been developing. So next is collagen 2. And the first thing you'll notice is that for collagen 2, you see the exact same pattern as you do for collagen 1, the spike um, downstream of that, of that MMP cleavage site, and then also more propeptide. Um, so again, more collagen 2 synthesis and more degradation of collagen too. And, and I also mentioned that we're only measuring proteotypic peptides. So what that means is, is peptides that are exclusive and unique to their protein chain. We're not looking at, at sequences of peptides that are ambiguous and that might map to multiple um, proteins. And so what we're seeing here is, 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 is truly collagen two specific and collagen one specific. And yet we're seeing the same changes. Um, but then 
in addition to, to, to those two changes, here we can see a left lateral specific increase um, that's only found in this part of, of the IVD. And it just so happens that that region is right in, in the middle of an antilopeptide um, um, uh, yielding region. And that is a very um, prominent biomarker of, of, of osteoporosis and collagen 2 degeneration. And so that change was only found on, in, it was, was tissue region specific in, in the IV in the context of aging. So I've had a few discussions today about the, the, the possibility of using this tool to look at splice variation. Um, it's not something that we've really looked at before. Again, this, this, this concept, um, this approach is only a few years old, so we haven't been able to clearly define its capabilities yet. But what, what, I did, what we did find that was interesting was certain proteins like Versacan, um, which is an important um, cell adherence prote um, proteoglycan, um, comes in many splice variant forms. So here we've got four, there's four different splice variants. Um, there's the V0 that contains both of these GAG alpha and GAG beta uh, domains. The V1 that only has the GAG beta, V2 only has GAG alpha, and then the V3 doesn't have either. And what we found was that um, right in this portion of the protein here, at the interface between the GAG alpha and the GAG beta region, we see a decrease in age versus young in terms of peptide yield. Now, it means that we're seeing, um, it means that, 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 that there's, some, there's something going on right at the interface between these two proteins. And so having talked to, to a few people who are, who are you know, experts in, 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 in Versacan, because I'm not, they suggested that really what we might be seeing is a, is a shift in, in, in one splice variant form in age versus young. So this is something that I think we'll, we'll need to follow up um, about whether we can use this, this, this tool to look at whether certain splice variants are, are um, you know, impacted in the context of aging or, or in, in disease as well, and whether we can use this tool to detect that. So another thing that came out of this, this um, study was the ability to, 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 to look at changes across different tissues and even across different species. So Herbert's mouse lung data versus Danny's IVD data. Um, when you look at certain proteins like fibronectin, for example, and you look at age compared to young, and you look at this peptide, this profile of, of difference and overlay, overlay the lines like we've been doing before, you can see that there isn't much parallel. There isn't much, much um, correlation between the changes. Right up until you get to this, re this central region over here, where you can see the exact same segment affected in the exact same way. Um, and this is irrespective of whether it's human IVD or mouse lung. And it just so happens that this region lies right bang in the middle of a, cell a prominent cell attachment region. So, and it's not just this protein we found um, conservation changes across the, 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 the two tissues. Um, we also saw it in the filament A domain, um, which we know forms this, this, this transmembrane um, bridge with fibronectin, and also in the G2 domain of lamin in, in, in basement membrane. So we're seeing certain regions affected in the same way, in the same proteins, across an entire ECM cell communication network um, that was yeah, conserved between um, different tissues and different species. Not to say that it's the same mechanisms that are causing this, but just that it's the same observation and it's cell attachment related. This is the kind of insight you can get by using this, this, this peptide mapping approach. So more recently, um, my lab has become quite interested in looking at basement membranes in the context of aging, and we've just managed to get a grant um, um, from the BBSRC to look at that using um, this tool and also following up some of the data that we've, we've found. So I'll talk a bit about that. Um, so in skin, the basement membrane is also impacted by photoaging and aging in general. So, for example, um, there's a basement membrane between the epidermis and the dermis, um, right at the interface of the dermal epidermal junction. And you can see that in photo exposed tissue, that, 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 that membrane becomes quite patchy, right? So, you get the disappearance of collagen 4 and, and, and collagen 7 that links 
that basic membrane into the dermal fibula, um, um, collagen one architecture. And so that kind of maps what we saw in our proteomics um, analysis, where we see an increase in, in the abundance of, of base membrane proteins. Now, this is why I, I, I say abundance and, and, and solubility kind of go hand in hand. Here we see a, we see a decrease, or so, so, so a, a, um, a disappearance of the base membrane. And in the mass spec, that, that manifests as an increase in abundance. But all that's really happening is because the base membrane is, become, it, it is becoming more soluble, we see more peptides being liberated. And so that manifests as an increase. And so it, 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 it's a change that goes hand in hand with what we're seeing in, in, in the histology. Um, but the question was, can we use this, this peptide mapping approach, this peptide location fingerprinting to look at structural changes in basement membrane? And so I collaborated with um, Rachel Lennon, um, who looks at kidney disease. So she looks at kidney fibrosis, but also aging um, kidney. And they had um, a data set that compared young and aged um, kidney. So the glomerulus of, of the kidney um, has a basement membrane which filters urea. Um, it's very um, similar to skin because it's a lot of, of the same components are in, 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 in glomerular basement membrane as in skin, as an alveolar basement membrane. It's made of a lot of the same stuff. There are certain differences, but the idea is that because there's an overlap in the composition of the basement membrane across different tissues, you might be able to find um, conserved mechanisms of aging across all of them. And so the, you know, right now um, it's clear that we can find differences, but we will really want to know a bit more about the nature of the changes that are occurring. And so in addition to look just probing the structure of proteins, we were also going to look for things like cleavage sites, things like endogenous peptides. And so we're really trying to, 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 to build a picture as to what exactly is causing these regional changes that we're seeing. And so agrin, um, which is a very important protein that links the laminin um, meshwork to the cell membrane, um, we found affected. So the NTA domain, which is the part that binds the central part of laminin here, was we, we found a significant decrease in peptide yield here. And what we also did was we, instead of look, looking at, uh, at just triptych peptides from trypsin, we used a, a technique called entails, which um, looks at endogenous cleavage sites. So peptides that don't have an arginine or a lysine, which is where trypsin cleaves, but instead have another uh, amino acid, and they're therefore evidence of, a, of an endogenous cleavage within um, your tissue. And what we found is that we see a significant, in, the, in this particular part of the domain, we see a significant increase uh, or significant, significantly higher peptides being yielded um, in younger age that are um, non triptic And so the idea is that we think we're getting um, MMP um, cleavages within that certain area of the protein. And what we've also done with the help of Matisse um, is develop another web tool, and I don't have time to talk about that, but it essentially uses a, a, a neural network um, model in order to predict MMP susceptibility across protein structures. And using that, that's another paper, you can, you, can, you can read that if you want, but using that, what we found was that there's a cluster of predicted MMP7 cleavage sites, which, are, which is known to, to, to degrade agrin, and that was clustered right at the point where we see that change in, in aging as well. So again, you know, omics is always hypothesis generating, it's always screening, but with this approach, because we can correlate it to cleavage sites and endogenous um, endogenously cleaved peptides and other um, um, susceptibility sort of tools, it gives us a, a, a really clear sort of direction to go in in terms of mechanism of what we think is occurring. And so laminin uh, BA2 and, and, and gamma 1, we also saw changes. In, in the very similar region. And what we find is that this region overlaps in this, this cross um, um, trimer that um, laminin forms. In the lung, it, 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 I think it's 511, in the kidney it's 521. Um, 
but essentially it overlaps. And so what we're seeing is, is a change that is um, related to the, to, to the tertiary structure or the quaternary structure of this protein. And, and it just so happens that this region also is important um, as a docking um, um, site to um, integrin. And so uh, we're thinking that that has implications as well in terms of changes to the basement membrane. Now, I mentioned that um, the alveolar basement membrane in lung is made up of a lot of the same stuff as the, the glomerular basement membrane. And so we were interested in looking at changes that might overlap between aging mouse lung and aging human kidney. Um, and interestingly, we found a couple of, uh, uh, of proteins that, that um, showed very, very similar, if not the same patterns in aging kidney as in aging lung. So periostin, um, which is an important um, ECM, ECM linking protein, uh, we found you know, this characteristic increase in peptide yield followed by a decrease, followed by an increase. That kind of pattern occurs both in kidney um, and in, in mouse lung. And if you look at the 3D structure of um, the homodimer of periostin, um, which it, can, it looks like a set of lips, the exact same domains are affected in the same way. And what's interesting is that these fast one domains where we see the changes are, 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 the, are the ones that interact with the wider ECM, including BNP1. Um, and so um, implications of tissue homeostasis there. Um, the next um, change that we saw is actually what um, got us the BBSRC grant in the first place, um, which is we see a significant decrease in peptide yield in young, uh, sorry, in age versus young, right in a segment of collagen 4, um, which is at the interface of the MC1 domain. And this occurs again, both in kidney and in mouse lung. Now, what's interesting is that this NC1 domain of collagen 4 is known to be cleaved off by membrane MMP to release canastatin, which is a major time um, that induces proliferation, migration, and it inhibits um, angiogenesis. So it was thought to be um, a, 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 a cancer therapeutic at one point. I, I don't think it's, it's being considered the case anymore, but certainly it has implications um, in tissue if this fragment is able to control um, aspects of tissue homeostasis. So we wanted to make sure that this that this kind of was the case, um, and what we found was that um, we do get we do see a, a higher number of endogenous uh, cleaved peptides in younger than age that mirrors that. But what really convinced us was the fact that right at this point where we see the change, we see a young specific peptide that is present in all the young samples, but not the age samples at all, and this. Um, this alanine right here is actually the cleavage position of um, of um, this MMP memory brown MMP that releases canstatin. And so we were quite convinced at this point um, that we're, we're looking at a cleavage event. Of course, you know, the part of the grant will be to to validate that and to look at the impact of canstatin in the context of um, aging um, lung and skin and kidney. Now, just to throw a spanner in the works, we also decided to look at reactive oxygen species susceptibility of this part of the protein. And it just so happens that this NC1 domain, where we see the changes, is also turns out to be um, the area which has the most ROS sensitive amino acids of, of the entire protein, with that segment being the one that has the most in it. And indeed, if you look at methionine oxidized peptides, you see a lot more in younger than age. So at this point, we were asking ourselves, is it, is it ROS? Is it MMPs? Is it both? Uh, but then we were reassured when we spoke to um, um, Carl um, Cadler, um, who basically said that he's seen this before. And quite often, when you get a cleavage, um, a prominent cleavage site within, within an ECM protein, ROS is there to denature the protein to allow MFP to come in and cleave it. And so quite often reactive oxygen species and its susceptibility to it comes hand in hand with a cleavage event. And so that kind of made sense in our, in our minds a bit more. Um, 
So just in the last few minutes, I don't know how much time I've got left, actually. Uh, I, I think I've got a bit of time. I'm going to talk about a collaboration that I've had with Tracy. I think some of you may have worked with Tracy. But like, Gizzy, have you worked with Tracy Hustle before? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so she uh, she looks at lung immunology in the context of, of, of inflammation and disease. I think she's done some fibrosis work as well. Um, but this was a, a study that we ran together where we um, infected the mice with influenza, and then we looked at them recovering and, and how that, that impacts the, the basement membrane. So we, so we infected them with, with influenza. They recovered from their symptoms. So usually they, they have a, a, a weight loss. And then by day 12, they, were, they fully recovered from that weight loss and from the symptoms. We then waited a further um, nine days and we removed the lungs and we did some proteomic mass spec. Um, we fractionated the samples to look at different um, proteins. So the, the, the fraction three, which, 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 which had the most sort of um, um, solu solubilization, had the ECM um, proteins in it, whereas the ones before had more intracellular cytoskeletal proteins. And so we were look, able to look at different um, compartments of, of the proteome. And so just focusing on the basement membrane right now, um, what we found was that if you look at if you look histologically, um, 14 days after flu infection, once the mouse has recovered, you still see that the basement membrane is quite patchy, especially around the, around the alveoli. Um, you know, you you see some quite big spaces there, and there seems to be quite a lot of um, um, macrophages kind of gathering um, at the interface between the airways um, uh, and the basement membrane, sort of at, at that interface there. And that remains at day 21. So you don't seem to be getting much repair, despite these mice being asymptomatic and having fully recovered um, even 21 days after an infection. And that mirrors what we see in the proteomics. So um, you can see that when it comes to basic membrane components, you see a decrease in all those, in quite a few of those components compared to, to our, our PBS control. Um, Whereas the pericellular matrix, so things like fibronectin, um, tenacin, those, those glycoproteins that are laid down as a sort of it, uh, as a as a as a scaffold um, prior to the more hardy matrix being laid down, like collagen one and basement membrane, that seems to be increased in flu um, post flu um, versus versus control. And so by, by looking at the, the different fractions, what we could do is we could do this, uh, we could we could look at whether the solubility of those proteins um, are impacted in, in the disease. And what we found was, was that quite a few of those glycoproteins in particular, the solubility of those proteins changed in, in flu, um, post-flu um, versus the control. And so we, we were able to tell the solubility and therefore the, the stiffness and the crosslink, the, 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 um, how integrated they are within their networks, that seems to be quite different in um, post-flu versus control. So we ran our peptide location fingerprinting to look at structure associated differences. And indeed, the main thing we found was changes in the ECM, primarily in the basement membrane, just like we saw in the histology. But what was interesting was that we also see a lot of cha cytoskeletal changes. So changes within the, the epithelial um, connect, connection um, to the basement membrane. So, you know, changes, it, it, structure associated changes that, that seem to, to, to to go through the entire um, epithelial to, to basic membrane interface. And so one of the major findings of this paper, um, well, it's, it's currently a preprint um, that, we, that we've just um, published, um, is that again, collagen four, right at the NC1 domain, we're seeing a significant increase in peptide yield um, um, right in that same segment that we see in aging. And again, that is not only in collagen four, alpha two this time, we're seeing it in alpha one, alpha three, and alpha four. And it's not quite well known that, you know, there's six different, um, different chains of, of collagen four. They all associate into, into three different um, hexamers. Um, the, what the, and in, in the lung, you have the, the one, one, two, and the three, four, five um, configuration. And what we're seeing really is that a network is a network level change in um, that sort of interaction between the two trimers within the hexamer. Something has happened 
where we're seeing a disassociation or or a fragmentation that's leading to leading to the cleavage of uh, a, a major kind. So what's nice about collagen four is that every chain of collagen four does get cleaved at the NC1 domain and releases its own major kind. So for collagen four alpha one is arrestin, for two it's canstatin, tumstatin, um, tetrastatin. They all do different things, and we're seeing. A, 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 an event that, that could be cleavage in post flu versus um, control, which we think might, might have implications um, for the repair, the effective repair of the basement membrane, which doesn't seem to be occurring even 21 weeks after infection. And so I want to leave you with just a, um, a, a sort of, you know, something that we found quite interesting that came out of this study. The one thing that, 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 that we weren't expecting was that the macrophages, when we look at, at, at basement membrane components being, being expressed, so collagen four, the macrophages seem to line up. So we thought it was a bit strange that a macrophage was, was expressing collagen four, a basement membrane protein. You know, they're very well known for damaging basement membranes because they have to extravasate through um, um, your arteries and, 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 and the vasculature, for example, to get to the site that they need to get to in order to deal with um, um, pathogens, for example, but they're not very well known for repair. And so the question is, can macrophages repair a basement membrane? Of course, we weren't that convinced by this picture over here because macrophages tend to eat things, they phagocytose cells that are sick. So is it that they're expressing collagen four or have they just eaten a cell that had collagen four being expressed? We weren't sure. So what we did was we um, isolated macrophages from our um, post-flu mouse lung, and we coached them for, for a, a few days, and then we ran some qPCR, and we found that, indeed, they are inherently expressing collagen 4. And in fact, if you stress them out if, um, by adding LPS, you don't seem to get the same, the same um, upregulation uh, uh, of, of these basic mm -hmm. transcripts, apart from collagen 4 alpha 2, which, which you do. But for the others, it seems to be um, blue phenotype specific, which we thought was quite interesting. And so we were looking back at literature thinking as anybody else found this before. And actually, um, this is from the Kaminsky lab. Um, and you know, they, they ran a, a, an analysis where they, where they profiled the, uh, different macro, macrophages in COPD and IPF and in control lung and what they found was um, in this UMAP analysis, the IPF specific macrophages, if you select for collagen four alpha two, they seem to be expressing inherently collagen four. And so in, fibro in a fibrotic lung, you're getting collagen four being expressed. Why, I'm not sure, but maybe it's part of that sort of runaway wound healing effect. And what's also interesting is that the ability of macrophages to lay down collagen 4 might even be um, evolutionarily conserved because in Drosophila, for example, the hemocytes, which, are the, which is the equivalent of a macrophage, they are the only cell capable of laying down basal membrane. And in fact, they do a certain development. And if you, if you overexpress um, a marker as a, 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 a chemotractin of, of macrophages, you completely lose um, uh, this um, lay, this lay down, laying down a basement membrane during the development of the fly. And that's, also, that's something that the Brian Stramer lab um, found a few years ago over in, in, in KCL. So I'll just leave you with that, you know, do, do macrophages express and repair basement membrane? That's something that I think we're quite interested in, in finding out as well. So um, key messages for this talk is peptide location fingerprinting, this tool that we use, it's free to use, it's a web tool. Um, I'm very happy for you to contact me if you've got any mass spec data or you want to go any mass spec studies to look at changes in, in, in structure in, in protein structure in the context of fragmentation and fibrosis, for example, or splice variation, whatever you want to have a look at. I'm very happy to collaborate on. It can be applied to any LCMS data. Right now we've got human, mouse, rat, horse, rabbit. Those are the, the constraints. But if you do work on anything else, then um, we can we can do that we can add that as well and we found that a combinational approach of plf and just normal relative standard proteomics 
um, leads to a more complete assessment of tissue proteostasis and a better understanding of what's going on in aging, but I'm guessing that it would be the same thing in a disease like fibrosis. And just to want to say off the back of um, this grant that that BDSRC grant that we got, um, so my lab's now advertising this. If you're a post a PhD student that's finishing, for example, or you're a postdoc that's whose contract's coming up and you're interested in what I've talked about today um, and in uh, moving to sunny Manchester, then let me know uh, and do apply. And yeah, I've got a lot of people to thank because um, uh, I've collaborated with quite a few people, but um, I'm not going to go through everybody. So thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. That was fantastic. Um, really, really uh, given us lots of things to think about. So one of the things on people one of the things that's been interesting us in, in fibrosis is how basement membrane behaves. Uh, because what we've found is that in early sort of IRD, early sort of fibrosis, there's actually an increase in collagen form uh, and, the, and, the, and the thickening of the basement membrane. Mm -hmm. But then as the fibrosis evolves, it gets lost completely. Oh, so, okay. So, you know, in, in the sort of end stage, if I lung, you can't find any collagen for, for a lot of money. Um, so, and, and when you look at changes in collagen for rates of change, it doesn't, doesn't seem to matter whether there's a rapid increase or a rapid decrease. It's the rate of change of collagen for, which uh, is prognostic. So, I was wondering how that may relate to some of the findings you've used to identify. So in terms of rate of change, because we're not looking at abundance, it, it, it is, we can't I can't really relate it to that. But what I can say is that collagen 4 is quite special. And it's special because it has the propensity that when it's degraded, it can release um, fragments that are bioactive. That, you know, there are six different fragments it can release, and those can promote cell proliferation. They can promote migration of, of, of macrophages. Um, they can um, inhibit angiogenesis. There's a lot of different things that can come out of the, the, the degeneration, the degradation of collagen four in the basement membrane. And, if, and what we've shown actually is that, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's in aging or in post-flu, that same region, which is where that, exactly where the fragment is cleaved off, um, tends to be the culprit, or at least, you know, associated in, 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 the, in this scenario and in Asia. Will it be in fibrosis? I'm not sure. But the idea is that you know, if you've got if you've got a, a, a these these matrix kind of fragments, or indeed any sort of ECM fragment that is bioactive, and, and and it plays a role in controlling tissue homeostasis in a way, and you either lose that or you promote that, then you get you get the deregulation, right, of homeostasis. So in this context, we're seeing more in flu, but then in the aging context, it's the opposite. We're seeing more in young. So that means that in young, we get, it's likely we're getting fragmentation, and that's that's a healthy tissue, and then that's lost in age, and that's unhealthy. So you know, I don't know what way around it might it would be in fibrosis, or whether it, it, it even has an impact in fibrosis. But I think that's you know, looking at uh, at fragmenting matrix and the impact of these fragments um, might be quite interesting. Looking at and do you think they change with the so the, the flu is kind of interesting because the, the flu is a resolving model generally. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you were to give them recurrent flu or it might say, for example, would, would you get a different fragmentation? Do you think in in the previously fragmented, would you just get more of the same? I'm not sure. What we did find, and I didn't conclude these in the slides. Was that um, in aging mouse lungs? So again, we, we have Herbert Schiller's, um, you know, uh, lung model where we see changes like this. Um, and again, we see this. We see the same change but reversed, right? Um, but in laminin, there are many regions of laminin where you get the same um, thing occurring in inflammation or post-inflammation as you do in aging. So our what we're postulating is that recurrent events of inflammation 
lead to an aging phenotype, right? So maybe in the context of, of, of accelerating aging, for example, or, or, or you know, um, the, the more chronic, the, the more diseases you, you, you sort of accumulate over time, the more aging your tissue becomes, and that's becoming more sort of a, a, of a thing of the aging uh, feel. So you might be onto something in that context, where repeated infection leads to a more degenerative um, sort of pathological scenario that then leads to, to a more age phenotype. And in terms of the macrophages, so you showed uh, that data uh, mm -hmm. with the SP. I mean, were they SPP1 positive macrophages? I, I, I'm going to be honest, I did, we, we didn't look that deep. <laughs> um, yeah, because yeah. it'd be interesting to because you you, know, you have you have both reparative and degenerative macrophages. So yeah. trying to understand yeah which one which is. one uh, and what it's interesting that they're secreting collagen for is that well they're synthesizing it. This I guess there's no evidence that they're it's transcript it. yeah and rather than deposition yeah that's true yeah so that's that that's the missing so again this wasn't a macrophage study yeah. this was just something that we found sort of. At the same time as looking at this, but really what we want to know is you're right. Do macrophages actually lay down basic membrane, and if, and they do in the fly, right? right. Quite quite well, but do, but do they do it in the context of it's, disease? Because or? the commonest cell to lay down basic membrane in the lung is the AT1 cell, mm -hmm. which is the cell that's lost in fibrosis. So you could imagine that other cells are desperately trying to compensate themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that might be quite a, a, an interesting, thera, you know, therapeutic sort of approach if you can get another cell to, to repair. And, and in fact, you know, the, the, I think, you know, the, romanticizing the idea of, of a macrophage being a sort of mobile sentinel that is able to go to all your different tissues and repair, I think is, is, is quite lovely. But I'm not sure if, that, if that's the case, but I, I, this is what, I, what I'm hoping for. <laughs> yeah. But, so, I mean, it's, it's great data and a really cool tool. I was wondering whether, with your application to different mouse models, whether you also have looked into application to transgenic mouse models, for example, where you say you've got your young and you're aging, are you able, or have you looked at sort of key genes that may be involved in aging to, for a sort of proof of principle that, you know, gene you're able to detect a, a peptide signature when there's a variant in the gene you know that may be associated with disease so not not yet in the in the context of splice variation for well, example, i mean but it, but you're but you're right in the grant that we've got now we're not, not in mouse but we're looking at c elegans where we're inducing a, a, a sir rna we're knocking out mmp7 and so if you knock out mmp7 the idea is you don't get fragmentation of collagen four, and so that should disappear, that signature that we see. And so that's what we're gonna be doing to check whether, well, not to check, I, I, I mean, to, 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 to verify, yeah, to verify whether, whether that fragmentation is, is occurring, yeah. But if, for example, in, in your skin study, there must be um, GWAS where there are, there are certain common variants that are mm -hmm. associated with different, uh, or early aging or, or, or the skin or, yeah, it's quite rotten skin diseases, right? Yeah. So can you can you, for example, create your model with those variants and then see whether you're getting the same peptide signature? That in, would be very interesting. In a, an aged mouse as well as your the transgenic mouse, or maybe not, maybe not mouse, but a different animal model. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, just to see whether you know whether you can give evidence that it's there's a genogenetic influence on protein that is then being yeah. detected in the, the, the LCMS, or yeah. whether it is all just about the, yeah. the protein itself. Not I think so, it, that would be very interesting. I think in certain cases, you'd be, you'd be absolutely right. I think in the context of, um, of ECM acquiring damage by the, by the exposome or by you know, repeated exposure to MMPs and ROS, that might be more independent. Um, it's just whether there's a sort of susceptibility but, to, yeah. to that uh, yeah. exposure. 
And then the other mm -hmm. question I was kind of wondering about is what guides you to look at the particular peptide signature? As in, you know, is it just that laborious process of checking every single protein or are you driven by abundance and go, mm -hmm. okay, what's the most abundant thing if we, if we just look at the normal LCMS results yeah. and then we go, okay, these are interesting. Let's look in those in more detail or, yeah. or do you have a kind of systematic approach checks all these proteins so I find something we have more of a systematic approach now at the very beginning it was me literally clicking through every single protein to, to and looking at you know increases in certain parts and, and this asking the question what's important about that part of the protein uh, and so um, mm -hmm. i mentioned this to you before we got a phd student starting in october and their job is plf 2.0 where they're going to be overlaying cleavage sites um also Rather than representing the protein in 2D, they're going to be looking at it in 3D um, um, with, with alpha 4 models or with PGP structures that have already been um, deciphered. And then we're going to hopefully be using a, a more machine learning approach to look at the patterns and, and, and how they might, they might change. And I think through that, um, we can probably um, work, you know, it, it would be a lot less laborious than clicking through every single protein trying to correlate it to cleavage sites, deciding what is, you know, uh, unlike genomics and transcriptomics where you have 20,000 things you gotta look at, in proteomics, sometimes you've only got 100, 200 proteins. So clicking through 50 biomarkers is not that laborious. But you almost wanna kind of quantify it with some sort of similarity, dissimilarity kind of index so that you can prioritize some of the top so you can signatures score, versus yeah. other signatures. Yeah, that's true, yeah. Yeah, it's you know it's it's very hard to to there's so many different mechanisms and proteins that could be causing differences. So you almost need to to find a way to score things um, across different mechanisms and and and, and, and I think objectively it, too. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 quite challenging. But yeah, you're right. I mean, that that's the that's the next step definitely. And, and at the end, you sort of began to, to tease some stuff with the cytoskeleton and, and things like that, but you, you then showed us the collagen fold in the age of So yeah. have you found interesting things to do with, you know, the dining arms or the um, tubing in terms of acting or tubing? Yeah, so mostly it's, it's in the filament parts. So, so, that, that, so a bit like what we showed in the other paper, we're seeing changes in the filament, in the filament A domain, um, where... It, it, where you get that transmembrane bridge uh, between, in between integrin and, and, and the matrix. Um, you know, I think the further away you get from the actual change that you see, the harder it is to associate the change that you're, that you're seeing. Um, but no, it, it, we, we've only looked at the immediate network of that base of membrane and not down the line so the wider. is there a sort of related biological process because i mean to me that sounds very much about like cell migration to yeah. some extent because it's very much at that point at which the filaments are touching the basement membrane and yeah is that i mean is, is that trap with i mean certainly so what, what what you're seeing really is is a picture of the entire protein so if you can imagine in a scenario where the basement membrane is damaged and you're seeing disassociation or degeneration of the collagen four network. The cells don't have anything to adhere to. So what are they doing? They're laying down a um, pericellular matrix like fibronectin instead of adhering to a base membrane, which is what we see. You know, all those glycoproteins go up. Um, and the way that they adhere to that pericellular matrix is very different to what the way they would adhere to a base membrane. And so that's reflected in the cytoskeleton in, in, in the structure of the cytoskeleton. Right. So I think it makes sense, but you know, trying to, and it makes sense, it's evidence by what we've seen, but trying to tie it all together, each individual component of the cytoskeleton representing a certain structure coming together and how that shifts is quite mind boggling. <laughs> Thank you. Aging and all changes in collagen evolution and move So how, if, for example, if you put your 
mostly mice model, for example, young, and you expose them to flu, and you expose them all to flu, how is the speed of recovery of the of a collagen for production between both of them? So if you were taking a young, a young model mouse, and, a, and, a, and an a age mouse, and you would infect them and look at recovery, and recovery, that would be very interesting to do. And definitely, you didn't correct this for aging, or you didn't ex expose all of all of them for age. They were supposed to do. No. So it was, so this was through a collaboration with Tracy, and Tracy doesn't really work in aging. Um, so she was interesting, interested more in the inflammation aspect. But I think that would be a really interesting experiment to run. Um, and we didn't account for aging, no, um, uh, or, or, or look at that as a variable. But yeah, I mean, you know, but the thing is, we, we didn't find, we found that the base memory doesn't repair in um, young, I think these were um, young mice. I, I forget the age of them, but they weren't particularly old mice. And yet we still don't see the base memory repairing in 21 days. It could be that if you wait six months that you do see something, um, but at least in that time frame where they, they're asymptomatic, we don't see any, any And, and for example, when you compare the lungs of the young, well, we say that they're younger now, they can survive flu. Yeah. Uh, this tissue looks like an old tissue now, huh? in comparison. Yeah. Go, yeah. Yeah. Like it's aging significantly. Yeah, in fact, histologically, I would say um, the the post flu um, lung looks very similar to an aged lung. I mean, histologically, you can't see much difference. You see, you see patchy basement membrane, you see patchy alveolar, you know, you know, you see spaces between the alveolar the alveolar basement membranes, um, and and so you, you, it's hard to to tell them apart really. Um, it's very similar histologically. Yeah. Um. And uh, final, uh, final question about macrophages. So, how much you think that, for example, this is like obesity will affect the repairing of the cerebral matrix, where the macrophages they are much more pro-inflammatory? You think that there will be like any inhibition of? I, I don't know. I mean, this is it. You know, they they're pro-inflammatory. Yes. Um, the question is, are they always pro-inflammatory or are there states where they, they transition from being um, an immune cell to being a matrix producing cell? And I don't know if that's ever been really looked at in that context, right? Um, you can imagine that pyroblasts, they spend their whole, their whole lives you know, producing matrix, right? That's their job. Um, it's very hard for a cell to do Hundred different things at the same time. So if, it, if a macrophage is focusing on repair, is it also at the same time focusing on um, uh, on, on immune related pathways? You know, phagocytosing uh, um, um, or, 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 or whatever, right? Especially if, if 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 you've recovered from that disease, the pathogen is no longer there. What are the macrophages still doing there, right? It could be that there's, there's still inflammation going on, or it could be that they're doing something that's more reparative. I don't know. Yeah, you know always they have the issue that they have releasing power line. Yeah. But no, that's a good No. So, I mean, we thought that they were, that maybe they were just eating fiber blocks, which is why we, we saw the collagen floor, but it turns out that it's an inherent thing. So, yeah. yeah. I'd like to circle back on a bit on uh, using application to detect protein. So currently, with what technology you're using, what's the most difficult part to be detected? What, what's the bit? So the biggest limitation of, yeah. of, of PLF, I would say, is is coverage. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, un unlike traditional proteomics, where you can have one or two peptides from your protein, and you can correlate that with abundance. Mm -hmm. Um, of your protein, so whether it goes up or down. Um, here, really, you need quite a few peptides across the entire structure of a protein in order to, to identify a difference. So it's really the top sort of 20, 30 proteins that you get a really good coverage for. Um, now, that's not always the case. Sometimes you may only be seeing, you know, the end of a protein and some interesting changes are occurring there, right? Um, but the more that, the more that you observe and measure the more you're able to detect. So for me, I think that's the biggest limitation. It's getting better 
because mass spec technology just gets better all the time. I mean, now is you know we're swapping, we're going from data dependent acquisition to data independent, which is a game changer. You guys probably don't know a lot about mass spec, but basically it means we're detecting a lot more peptides um, and a lot more signal um, by doing this kind of using this kind of approach. Um, and with machine learning now, it's a lot easier to 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 um, to correlate peptides back and um, peptide spectra back to the protein. And so we've got a lot more peptides that we identify compared to before. So it's getting better and better. And now actually it's getting so good that we're we're also, I didn't show this either, but we're using laser capture microdissection to enrich for different um, parts of, of the tissue. So for basement membrane, we're enriching for basement membrane in skin. And, and, and that's working very well with PLF. And so we don't need a whole chunk of, 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 of lung in order to do this kind of work. Now all we need is you know, tissue sections and we're, and we're able to get a decent profile of some of the most abundant protein. Can you do that apart from the boost? You can, yeah. Apart from the embedded form of the boost. You can, yeah. I mean, it's, it's not as good as just normal, you know, fresh, uh, fresh or, or frozen, but yeah. You can do it. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, it's five plus five. Uh, so I think uh, it just reminds me to thank Alex for the, once again, for an excellent lecture. Lots of food for thought and uh, future opportunities for collaboration, I'm sure. Uh, and thank you for coming all this way. Thank you.